Yep. Hey everyone, my name is Umair Khan. Um, I'm the community chair at Spiffy and I also work at HPE. Uh, today's virtual presentation is part of uh, a frequent series of virtual sessions we do for the Spiffy community, uh, talking about different use cases about Spiffy, case studies, and so on. Uh, for those of you who don't know and are new to Spiffy Inspire, um, Spiffy Inspire provide a universal service identity control plane for today's distributed systems. Uh, the, this identity plane is designed for today's cloud native and zero trust based architectures. Uh, both Spiffy and Spire are part of the CNCF ecosystem and have recently moved to the incubate stage. Uh, and back when Spiffy and Spire started a few years back, uh, the projects were inspired by production ready systems at companies like Google and Netflix. And today we have the story of one of them, right? Um, today we have Ian Hacken. Hey Ian, uh, thanks for joining us today. He'll be talking about uh, how Netflix manages service identity at scale, especially as they move to microservices-based architectures uh, that a lot of organizations uh, are moving today. Um, he'll be covering the benefits they achieved, and then in the end, he'll also compare and contrast with the Spiffy and Spire projects. With that, Ian, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Amir. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about service identity at Netflix. Uh, my name is Ian Haken. Um, I'm a uh, security engineer on our platform security team here at Netflix. I've been here for about four years, um, pretty much working on everything I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so uh, I think we're going to have some time at the end for questions, but if you want to continue the conversation or ask me uh, questions later, um, you can find me online on Twitter. Um, and a really great place to continue this conversation is on the Spiffy Slack. So I encourage folks to head over there afterwards. Um, if you've got more questions. So before I get too far into it, I just want to mention a few other talks that folks from Netflix have given um, kind of in this subject area. So um, you can take a look at some of these talks later if you want to learn more. Um, in particular, I'll call out the presentation I gave uh, three years ago now um, that was called Secrets at Scale, uh, which covered uh, a lot of the same things that I'm going to be talking about today. And if you've seen that talk, then you might recognize a couple of the slides, but I also promise that a lot of what I'm talking about today is actually going to be original content. Um, but if you haven't seen that talk, then it might be something good to go watch after this. Uh, because I go into depth um, a lot more on kind of our secret management side as well, which might be interesting to you that I don't cover as much today. Um, but these are all good talks to look at if you want to learn more about um, some of the stuff that Netflix has been thinking about in this space. So with that said, let's talk about what Netflix does for uh, services. So uh, to really get into it, it first really helps to understand the Netflix ecosystem and the architecture that we've implemented for our services at Netflix. So as Umer said, uh, Netflix uses a microservice architecture and probably most people know what that means these days. But um, to be you know, kind of concrete about what I mean by that, to the outside world, Netflix is sort of this box you have you open it up in a web browser and you get videos out, right? But underneath the hood is actually implemented with a bunch of little microservices that talk to each other. And each microservice is meant to be sort of a relatively small code base, self-contained and really good at doing one thing. So you open up your browser and you go to Netflix and you fire off a request to get the home page. What actually happens is one request ends up going to our service to get your personal recommendations to fill out that list of movies. Another one goes out and asks, well, what movies have you seen recently? So we can show the bookmarks of like which episodes you're in the middle of. Another service is going to start retrieving all the box art for all those videos that need to show up. So that's the kind of separation of duties that microservices enables and allows people to kind of focus on doing their specific task. So Netflix has a microservice ecosystem and we have a really big microservice ecosystem. We have on the order of 10,000 applications running in that ecosystem and at peak during days we tend to be running on over 100,000 EC2 instances. So it's really big. So it's not just a microservice ecosystem. It's a really big, really complicated microservice ecosystem and it's definitely at the scale where no one actually has the whole picture in their head at this point. No one knows what all the services are. No one knows what talks to what. Um, so it's really important to have holistic tools that can be applied to a heterogeneous environment to kind of wrangle this infrastructure. 
So one of the other core uh, principles of the Netflix ecosystem is that we run an immutable infrastructure. And what we mean by that is that when an instance comes online, an EC2 or a container comes online, it's then usually not subsequently modified. So if you need to patch the service, you don't go on and drop a new jar on there. You update the source code, you run that source code through CI, you know, Jenkins or what have you. Um, those binary artifacts that come out of the CI system go into a service we call the bakery, which takes the base operating system image we have, drops your binary artifact on there, produces an AMI or a container, and then that's sent off to our orchestrator to actually spin up some EC2 instances or some containers. So if there needs to be a base a operating system patch, um, again, we don't usually go in and patch running instances. We instead rebake those binary artifacts and redeploy them. So uh, that's an important feature of our architecture because it enables a lot of properties. So our ecosystem is auto scaling. So in the middle of the night when everyone's asleep, we might only be running a few instances, but as everyone gets home from work, uh, a lot of people turn on Netflix and we will automatically scale up the number of instances that we are running in order to handle that load. And then, you know, when everyone goes back to sleep, we can take some of those instances away. And so everything in our ecosystem is really ephemeral. Um, instances are gonna show up and disappear kind of all on their own. And the way we engineer everything kind of has to respect that. But one of the benefits of that is that we're also self-healing. If some of the hardware in AWS goes bad and we need to retire a node or there's a software bug that gets caught in a loop and uh, we're able to detect the CPU spike, um, that instance is gonna get marked as bad. It's eventually gonna get terminated and auto-scaling is just going to eventually replace it. So all of this happens automatically. There's no sort of human intervention involved. So it's really important that whatever we construct isn't requiring manual human touches in order to add new instances. So let's talk about this story of identity at Netflix. So in the beginning, um, we had kind of your traditional perimeter sort of model. So I think in the beginning, there wasn't even VPCs, but uh, there was security groups that you could do to kind of build an isolated ecosystem inside AWS. And, you know, we have a handful of microservices that all kind of talk to each other and they talk to some distributed data source, stuff like Cassandra and DynamoDB. And basically there's not, not a lot of granular access control. You can have some security groups so that maybe some services can only talk to some data stores. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's pretty close to kind of that traditional perimeter model. So this kind of starts quickly breaking down as we have more needs. So uh, we pretty quickly ran into a need for key management because some of these data stores have some really sensitive information in them. They've got PII, like people's names and addresses and emails. Um, and we've also got payment card data in our ecosystem. So, you know, you sign up for Netflix, we have to charge your card and all that stuff lives in databases. And obviously we wanna keep that stuff encrypted at rest and in motion. And so we wanted a really good story around our key management. So we wanna be able to rotate keys. We wanna be able to decrypt stuff that was encrypted with old keys. Um, and we want, and because there's so much high through put on a lot of these operations, a lot of these keys are backed by HSMs. So we have a key service that's running in the ecosystem that sort of manages all these keys. It provides an interface to the HSMs that isn't PKCS11, um, and microservices can talk to it to do encrypt and decrypt operations as well as other stuff like signing as needed. Um, but we quickly run into this problem of without identity for the microservices in our ecosystem and without authentication, the microservice that needs to decrypt some PII out of the database is going to have access to all the same keys in the key service as the service that needs to decrypt credit cards. And that's bad, right? We don't want every microservice in our ecosystem with access to that payment card decryption key. So we immediately get into the problem of needing identity for our microservices. So we realized pretty quickly that we are going to need identity for all of our workloads so that services can implement access control. If I go back to this picture, the main problem is that with security group models, you can limit which microservices talk to you, but then you don't have insight into which specific microservices talking to you. And that's a problem when you're running something that's sort of multi-tenant or multi-client where you need sort of object level access control within that service. So, all right, how do you give clients identities and authenticate them? 
you know, one of the early ways, one of the naive ways of doing that is handing out certificates for your microservices. So you can mint them a certificate off of some internal PKI, shove that certificate and a key for it, in this case, inside a Java key store, because so much of our stuff runs Java. And then you protect that key store with a password and you hand that to your developers and say, you know, be careful with this. It gives you access to the credit card data. Um, and so they put that in their Git repo and they're off to the races. So obviously that's not great. Besides the fact that you've got plain text passwords sitting in Git repos now, um, it's something that anyone can basically just copy paste into a completely unrelated microservice and still access all the same data in that key service. We don't really have any authenticity of the identity of those clients because developers are able to just kind of copy paste them around. And this is something that, you know, we actually saw a lot in practice. Some other service spins up also needs access to some of the same like PII data. So it needs access to those same keys. And rather than going through the whole long process of asking an engineer to create them a new certificate, updating the ACL so that they have those, so that new certificate gets access to the same keys and then embedding that new JKS inside their new service. It's like, it's just way easier to just copy paste things around and you immediately lose insight into who's actually calling you and who has access to what. So, all right, this is sort of bad for a lot of reasons. So let's kind of try and do something a little better. Let's try protecting those passwords for the key source. So we at least don't have like plain text passwords sitting around in a database. Great. Now we don't have passwords in our uh, in our source repositories. What do we do to decrypt those passwords? Well, we can kind of set up some sort of secret service that uh, does password decryption for you. And when these things boot up, they can take their encrypted password, send it over there and get the old password back, which cool. Okay, now we don't have plain text passwords sitting in our source repositories. But how do you authenticate to the secret service? Well, you can't, you don't have any key store, you don't have the password for the key store. So the secret service is kind of a not so secret service. At the end of the day, it's unauthenticated and actually any microservice in the ecosystem can talk to this thing and decrypt passwords. So it is completely valid for someone to still copy paste that key store and that encrypted password and to have the exact same problem we had before. So this gets us into, you know, sort of a turtles all the way down problem, right? You want to protect a key store so you can create a password. You want to protect that password so you encrypt it. You want to authenticate to the password decryption service so you get an API token. You need to protect that API token. So it's, there's, there's sort of no end to this loop. We really need a different solution here. So what we really want is for all workloads to be able to get an identity without pre-existing credentials. This is the bootstrap identity problem. And this is what we set out to solve. And if you're here, you're probably at least familiar with the Spiffy community. And this is exactly what the Spiffy project sets out to solve as well. So how do we go about dealing with this? So most of our stuff runs in the cloud and this is going to enable us to perform some remote attestation of our workloads. So the cloud provider knows what images are running where, what AMIs, what machine images are running on what instances. So our cloud provider is gonna be able to facilitate remote attestation. So in AWS specifically, which I'm gonna use for most of my examples, uh, you can, an instance is able to request a metadata document describing information about that instance from AWS. So that metadata document is signed by Amazon using certificates and keys that only the Amazon infrastructure has access to. And that metadata is going to be unique for every EC2 instance. And it proves what the instance ID is and what AMI, what code is running on that instance. And so one service can get that metadata document and send it to another to prove, hey, I'm really running on this instance ID and it, that instance ID is running this AMI. So how do we specifically take advantage of this? So service foo, which wants to get an identity that it can use for the rest of the ecosystem is going to pass this metadata document over to our bootstrapping server. So it requests this metadata document from AWS. And here's an example of some of the stuff that might show up in there. Kind of the interesting stuff in particular is the instance ID and the image ID, um, but it's signed you know, like I said, with uh, this private key that AWS has access to that maps to a certificate that's rooted in um, some trust in AWS. 
So service two is able to get this from Amazon. It's able to pass that over to the bootstrap server so that it serves as proof of what instance ID service foo is running on. And then the bootstrap server is able to go get some extra metadata about that instance from AWS. So AWS is able to tell us a lot more about the instance, like what security groups it has, what IAM role it has. Um, but of particular interest to us is user data attached to that instance. So user data in AWS EC2 world is basically just arbitrary text that you can attach to an instance when you start it up in EC2. What we use it for specifically is dropping in some extra metadata about the code that's running on that instance. So here I've kind of given you a hint as to what I mean by that. So we've got this code identity string that's got an AMI and a source repository name. And that code identity string comes with a signature that is going to serve as the authentication for that code identity string. So what, what is this code identity string? What am I talking about here? Where does it come from? So this comes from deep integration with our CI CD infrastructure. So you probably remember this uh, little image here from the first slide uh, describing our immutable infrastructure, but it's also gonna be really useful for understanding the CI CD integration we have. So, at the start, we have source. So Git repositories have authorization on them. Uh, we kind of understand how that works with SSH keys and so forth. And nowadays, we also have Git commit signing. And so this is ultimately going to bind the code in that repository to authorize developers that can update it. So our CI infrastructure, i.e. Jenkins, is able to pull in that source code and produce some binaries. So Jenkins is going to be able to verify all the git commit hooks on there. It's going to be able to verify the authenticity of that source code and ultimately produce some binaries and sign those binaries. And it's going to include in the metadata of that signature some information about the git repository that that code came from. So when that gets passed off to the bakery, it's going to be able to verify the signature on that binary artifact that came out of CI and it's going to uh, pull the metadata out of that uh, signed binary. And then when it creates an AMI, it's going to produce its own signature that, and it's going to include basically the same metadata that produce, that serves as a binding between the AMI we just produced and the source repository that the binary artifacts originated from. And so ultimately we then stick that signed metadata that came out of the bakery into the user data of launched instances. So that's how that code identity gets embedded in that user data at the end of the day. And the signature that uh, is part of that code identity string, it comes from our bakery infrastructure specifically, which was able to produce this signed assertion that this AMI ID was built from this code source repo. Okay, so with all of that said, what is the bootstrap server actually responsible for doing? So it receives this instance identity document from the calling service. It verifies that it was really created by AWS, which proves to it that the call is coming from this instance ID with this AMI. It then calls AWS to get the user data and it's able to pull out the code identity string, verify that that code identity string was really made by our CI CD infrastructure. And then it has this binding between a given AMI ID and some code repository. So it's able to check that these AMIs are the same and ultimately know that the service that just called it was built from this source code repository for Foo. So now the bootstrap service has a high degree of confidence that the thing that is calling it came from this source code that we call Foo. So it's gonna be able to build an X509 certificate and stick Foo in the common name or wherever we want it so that Foo can use that as its identity as it calls into the rest of our ecosystem. Awesome. So summary of all the stuff I just said on the last four slides or so, the cloud provider provides us with a signed document which provides a cryptographic assertion of the instance identity and our CI CD integration provides a binding between instance identity and code identity. And code identity is the thing that's really useful for us because that's the thing that kind of has a meaningful name. So everything I just described was basically sort of AWS EC2 specific, although it really generalizes to running uh, virtualized instances on most of the cloud providers. So what about containers? What, what do we do for uh, stuff like Kubernetes? 
So the story is actually going to be totally analogous. So the host agent, which is going to be running directly on EC2 or whatever cloud provider you want, is going to get its identity the way I just described. It's, you know, a regular old EC2 instance, right? And so when a service foo wants to launch on that host agent, our host agent is going to set up an instance metadata service completely analogous to the one that Amazon runs. So that service foo can also request a metadata document from the host agent. Now, the difference here is that the metadata service is something that we control and we can embed whatever information we want in it. And in this case, we're going to throw in there what the ID is of the container that's requesting a metadata document. And we're gonna throw in those code identity strings for convenience. Um, but what is especially different about this flow is that the signature that's generated isn't a signature that's coming from Amazon because we don't have access to Amazon's keys, I hope. Um, instead, the signature that's getting made comes from the certificate that the host agent got from the bootstrapping process. So remember, certificates can be used for more than just mutual TLS. In this case, we're going to be using it to sign this metadata document so that the bootstrap service, when it eventually receives it, can verify that, hey, this a uh, document was created by this particular host agent. I trust that host agent to be launching service foo. So I'm cool giving a certificate back to service foo. So the rest of the flow is exactly what you expect. Service foo passes that metadata document over to the bootstrap service. It verifies everything, checks that code identity string and the signature, and then gives a service foo certificate back. So some of the details are different, but basically the picture looks exactly the same for containers as it does for something running directly on the cloud infrastructure. So what about things not in the cloud? So in this case, we're going to have, again, a totally analogous flow. So instead of running on some host agent, we instead abstractly are running some software running on hardware. So we're going to bring up service foo running on hardware, and we're going to take advantage of TPMs to attest the code that's running on that hardware. So I'm going to kind of go through this very quickly because I really don't want to get too far into how TPMs work and how remote attestation works because that could take like four hours if I go through all those details. But kind of the short story, especially if you're not familiar with TPMs and some of the neat stuff they can do, they are able to measure the software that's running on that system. And if you set everything up correctly so that you've got the right sort of chains of trusts going through your firmware to your bootloader to your operating system, um, then you have a full measurement of exactly what code is running and that measurement goes into what are called these PCRs in the TPM and the uh, and this whole document is called a quote in TPM parlance and that is something that's ultimately changed to a root of trust in something called an EK cert that's endorsement key certificate and that's something that's burned into the TPM and is basically signed by the manufacturer of that TPM. So Instead of Amazon being the root of trust in this case, it's basically the TPM manufacturer that's the root of trust in this case, but it's effectively telling us the same thing, which is some proof about exactly what software is running on that hardware. So the service is able to send that off to the bootstrap instance. It's able to verify that this was signed by a TPM manufacturer we trust and expect. The PCR values map to the hashes of service foo that we have previously measured. So we know that this thing is really running service foo. So I can give it a certificate. Awesome. So we have universal identity now. Everything that spins up in our ecosystem, whether it's a container, whether it's an EC2 instance, whether it's running in some data center or a rack in a closet somewhere, is able to sort of bootstrap an X509 certificate and everyone's able to talk to everyone else. But wait, there's more. What about the developer who's trying to run service foo at their desk because they're trying to extend it, they're working on code, they're fixing a bug. Um, and when they run service foo in their IDE, that thing's also going to reach out and try and talk to service bar, uh, just like service foo would if it's running in the cloud. It suggests that developers sitting at their desk also need some certificates. But that's fine. 
Um, all of our developers sitting at their desk presumably have some kind of corporate SSO that they can sign on with. And what we have done is set up a service that allows you to sign in with your regular credentials and download some certificates that embed your user identity in them. So these certificates are in the exact same PKI, same trust uh, domain as the services running in the cloud. And so this means that when you're running at your desk, whether you're developing service foo or running any sort of script that requires um, some sort of non-browser interaction, you're able to use those certificates to communicate with the rest of the microservices in our ecosystem. So basically what I'm trying to say is that the story for humans really isn't that different from the story for services in our ecosystem. The main difference is that humans can do things manually as needed. Um, so we have this sort of uh, SSO flow as they need to get new credentials. So we've got a universal identity what did that buy us? I would argue it buys us a lot. Um, the number one bullet I have on here is that it removes developer friction. I think there's a lot of security wins that I have in the uh, bottom few bullets, but I think the developer experience is so vastly improved by having this universal identity delivered at runtime that it bears uh, putting on top. So. Um, when developers need to spin up a new service, they don't have to go talk to the security team and request new certificate keys. They don't have to go through some self-service UI to get those certificates and keys. They don't need to figure out then how to protect them. What is the difference between PKCS1 and PKCS8 keys? What is a Java key store? They don't need to figure out any of that. They don't need to rotate these certificates as they expire. They don't need to uh, suffer outages because they forgot to rotate those certificates or they rotated them in their source code, but they forgot to redeploy. Um, and then this last bullet, which I think is really useful and really good to mention, because as I said, we have the same infrastructure for both services and users in our ecosystem. Developers don't need to worry about all the different authentication methods that exist and how uh, a request came in, whether it was OIDC or SAML or Mutual TLS. At the end of the day, we are delivering them the identity of the caller, and that's really all they actually care about. They don't care about exactly how that caller came in. So developers love this. Um, security loves this because there's no more secrets baked into images or embedded in Git repos that can just be copied around or accidentally pushed to GitHub. Um, it enables uh, mutual TLS, so we immediately gain confidentiality and integrity of our data in motion, checks lots of compliance boxes, checks lots of uh, security concerns. Um, all services now are able to implement granular access control. That's really where we started. So our key service now has a really high degree of confidence about who is calling them, and it can do this kind of key level authorization checks. And finally, it enables a lot of further security benefits that you can start building on top of this infrastructure, like ensuring that every service just have, has access to the microservices it actually needs. So you can do least privilege. You can also do some policy right sizing with some uh, auditing of exactly who's calling who and start implementing some automatic policies based on that. So uh, one of the last things that I wanna mention is the sort of problem of scaling identity in the Netflix ecosystem. And to kind of describe what I mean here, and I think really illustrate this, I'm gonna take a specific example of something that exists in the Netflix ecosystem. So our media encoding team is a team of, a uh, big team of some really smart engineers that work on the codecs used to encode the uh, Netflix library. So, uh, you know, they're, their goal at the end of the day is to produce higher quality video files at lower bit rates. And that way you get a better streaming experience. And the way they do their work is iteratively, right? They come up with a tweak to some algorithm and they want to run that against our catalog and figure out, did this actually produce better quality files? Did it produce smaller files? And they're not gonna sit at their desk while they encode thousands and thousands of clips. They're going to use a platform for that. So here I've got an example platform that can enable this, the encoding platform. And so when a developer comes in and they've got some new code that they want to have run against all of the files in our catalog, they're going to submit it to the encoding platform. The encoding platform is going to bake a container that has that code that's gonna run against every 
clip in our ecosystem, and it's going to launch a new workload, or really a bunch of workloads in a batch management system so that it can run kind of in parallel for every clip in our catalog. So it might launch a service called encoding worker trial that is going to uh, kind of run this trial and produce a report about the file sizes of its output. So when, as the engineer is kind of iterating on this and deciding whether or not this was a good change, he might eventually decide that this is the right change to make. And so I'm going to cut a release uh, that actually re-encodes the entire catalog and makes that available to customers of Netflix. So they're going to do the same thing. They're going to go to the single coding platform. They're going to say, here's the new final revision of my codec. It, that's going to spin off a bunch of batch jobs as well. Basically the same thing as the trial batch jobs, but these are going to be release batch jobs. And the big difference is that these release batch jobs at the end of the day are actually going to push the final artifacts into our catalog. So what am I trying to illustrate here with this example? Well, both of these services are going to end up, or both of these batch jobs are both going to end up calling a lot of the same microservices. So they're going to call our manifest service in order to find out, like, what are all the clips that I can try and encode? It's going to call out to a reporting service to be like, well, here's the, all the artifacts I created. Here's their file sizes. This is when they were encoded, yada, yada, yada. Uh, the big difference is that the release workloads are going to actually push their artifacts to the catalog. And this is something that we want our release workloads to be able to do. And we definitely do not want our trial workloads to do. So this is tricky because it means that all of these services except for one want to have the same access control rules for these two different services, the trial service and the release service, but the catalog service wants different access control rules. So in order to have different access control, these two services have to have a different identity. But having these two identities have almost the same ACLs in every other system becomes really difficult to manage. You can imagine if there's some change to the way this platform works and there's a new service that they need to talk to. And so an engineer is like, hey, can you grant access to the encoding worker trial app? Um, they might add that and then forget that they also need to grant the same access to the encoding worker release app. And so all this stuff gets out of sync. It becomes really hard to manage. So what we do in practice is instead of giving these services different names, we give them the same name, but we give them a different detail attribute. And so this means that all these services that are in common can just add access to the encoding worker service. But then this catalog service that actually cares about the difference between the trial service and the detail and the release service are able to look at this additional detail and only grant access if that detail says release. So what I'm really trying to get at here is an example of how we have started adding additional attributes to our identity that really uh, empower us to make simple ACLs when we need them, but then also get much more granular access control for those services that need it. So I spent a lot of time talking about access control and how we're able to sort of write these ACLs and provide granular access based on service identity. How does all of that actually work in this ecosystem? I definitely think it's worth kind of talking about how we think about that, especially uh, in the context of that previous slide where I've talked about the value of adding these attributes. So, all right, we've got service foo calling service bar over mutual TLS. Where does service bar get its certificates from? Well, it gets it from a workload API. This is exactly the spiffy model, right? So there's this unauthenticated agent running locally that bar is able to get its certificate and keys from in order to do mutual TLS and authenticate to other services in the ecosystem. Um, but we, what we also have when we make this connection is the authentication context of who is calling it. So after we've decoded that certificate and extracted all these attributes, it might look something like this. You've got the app name or the service name. Um, you might have an AWS account ID, assuming this is something running in AWS. You might have an attribute for what environment this is in, i.e. test versus prod versus staging. Um, whatever else you may have. You might have some information about like what AWS region it's in, what instance ID it is, what AMI it is, what container it is. Uh, at this point, we've got, you know, dozens of attributes. And what Service Bar ends up doing with this authentication context is throwing it to an authorization API, which is 
totally analogous to the workload API. So it basically has one method called is authorized, and it takes in this authentication context of the service that just called it and some policy name that Bar cares about. Depending on the granularity of its access control, this could be something general, like who's allowed to call service Bar, um, or it might be something specific, like is this caller allowed to use key Baz within the service bar. Um, and this is awesome because just like we have universal identity, this gives us a universal way to do authorization. Because when you have a user coming in, whether it's through a browser or using those certificates that they got um, through that interface I described, you still end up getting an authentication context that might have your email, the domain, whether it's an employee versus a contractor versus some third party. Um, media consultant um, that has access to our SSO, you get all that information also in the form of an authentication context interface. And that same interface, regardless of how you came in, can end up getting passed to this authorization API. And the is authorized call ultimately just gives you a yes, no answer that allows service bar to give you a 200 or 403. Let me take just a few more minutes uh, to talk about what that authorization service is actually doing under the hoods, because I think it sort of really goes back to informing uh, how we think about identity and those attributes inside the identity. So this is the picture I just had from the previous slide where you've got this is authorized call. And what this agent does that exposes the authorization API is call back to our policy management database and microservice. So the authorization agent is responsible for doing a lot of things like caching all the data it needs to evaluate these policy decisions, keeping that cache up to date. Um, service bar will usually have a manifest of all the policies it cares about. So the agent will actually proactively go fetch all the policy data in advance. Um, and that way we can ensure that all authorizations can actually be evaluated locally, which is really important inside a giant microservice ecosystem because it means that you don't have round trip pops as you go through a hundred different microservices is trying to process a request. So that's how we uh, get the policy data into the authorization API. Humans can uh, use a UI interface for managing those policies. So what do those policies actually look like? Well, in the previous example, I was describing kind of a uh, coarser policy for just all the callers who might be able to access service bar. And a developer or engineer using this interface can, for example, just say, foo is allowed to, uh, is authorized according to this policy. And they can optionally add detail or any other attributes they might care about, or they can just leave that blank, meaning they don't actually care about those attributes. Um, and that's sort of the, the attribute-based access control that can be enabled through this ecosystem. Um, but we also support role-based access control. So you can say that also anyone that has the internal role or is part of the internal group also has access to this policy. And so you can sort of nest membership that way and either, again, add apps directly to that uh, internal role or do something more attribute based and say anyone that has this particular attribute value, like this account ID that's meant to represent an internal AWS account, gets to be a member of that group. And similarly, you can say any user that has domain employee gets to be a member of that group. So it's this nice hybrid solution of attribute based and role based access control. That, and now that enables us to get really granular service uh, authorization. It allows humans to be kind of first class citizens just like services. And it allows us to really take advantage of these attributes so that you can specify as much or as little about the caller as you care about for your use case. So, all right, a lot of talk about what Netflix does. Obviously, I'm here uh, talking to a lot of folks interested in the Spiffy project. So how does all of this compare and contrast to Spiffy? So there's a lot of similarities and, you know, it's not a coincidence. Uh, I think a lot of Spiffy was sort of modeled on some of the work that Netflix did in this space. And some of the ways that Spiffy has evolved has been stuff that Netflix has also picked up. So there's a lot of stuff in common. Um, so X509 certificates as the first class identity type and sort of primarily using those from mutual TLS is definitely something uh, in common between these two solutions. So we both have this idea of an unauthenticated workload API because it's critical to the spec that you have 
no credentials required in order to get your identity for your service-to-service uh, -service authentication and communication. So uh, something sort of newer in the spiffy spec and also newer in our environment that I didn't really get into today, um, but I'm happy to answer questions about, is the idea of using JOTS for transitive authentic uh, authentication use cases. So when you have 10 microservices in a row and you want to know what user originated the request, you need some way to pass that information along that isn't um, mutual TLS because you're not able to actually propagate that in a sort of cryptographically verified way, whereas JOTs are bearer tokens and enable that kind of use case. So uh, that being said, lots of differences. The uh, main one that I was really kind of uh, talking about at the end there is kind of the way we've evolved into utilizing attributes really heavily in our identities. Um, a primary identity string is rarely sufficient these days. We look at those attributes a lot. Um, and so being able to kind of have uh, something other than just a primary identity string is really uh, kind of core to our system at this point. Now, if you decided to uh, use the spiffy spec in such a way that you have kind of an opaque identifier, um, you can certainly encode, say, an entire JSON object into the path of a SVID. Um, but you kind of have to be okay with that identity changing over time, even for the same workload as you add more attributes to your ecosystem. So you can kind of, kind of make it work, but it's a sort of architectural difference that is an explicit part of our ecosystem. That being said, Spiffy also does a lot of things that Netflix doesn't um, because, you know, we are very purpose-built for, for our problems. So, uh, Spiffy has more general support for JOTs. Our usage is very opinionated. We sort of only deliver them over mutual TLS connections because they're meant to sort of narrow the scope of what a request is allowed to do as opposed to being a form of authentication independent of uh, X509 certificates. Um, it's, uh, we have a singular trust domain at Netflix. So all users, all workloads, whether you are an internal employee or someone that works at the New York Times that has a sign in to our media site, um, you can get a certificate. So everyone gets a Spiffy certificate or a Netflix certificate in our ecosystem. So it's really important for all of our workloads to do authorization on top of just authentication. Um, but because, you know, we're set up for this single trust domain, we haven't run into the problem of needing to enable federation at this point. And that's something that Spiffy has really thought of very deeply and that um, I'm definitely looking forward to being able to take advantage of long term, especially as more organizations adopt the Spiffy spec and that enables us to just use uh, spiffy cert from the New York Times as opposed to having to have those users go through our SSO system and get one for our ecosystem. So what about uh, Netflix versus Spire? What are the uh, differences in specific to the implementation? So again, there's a lot of similarities. So we do frequent rotation of credentials. We rotate them hourly-ish. There's some noise in there, but basically everything is short-lived. So uh, everything gets rotated automatically. Um, and you know the attestation and resolution story is very similar between the two. Um, yeah, I don't even know if there's, there's much more to say about that. It's, it's basically the same thing. Obviously, there was a little bit of difference in kind of the container model, um, but the, the kind of trust model there is actually basically the same. There's just kind of difference in the details. That being said, uh, there are a couple of big differences. So in our ecosystem, we have no registration database or API. Everything is basically stateless. And we're able to do that because instead of having some uh, kind of deployment orchestration engine adding a registration entry that says, well, this AMI or this instance ID is supposed to have this code identity. Um, we embed all that in our code identity signature that's part of CI CD, and that's kind of able to be provided at runtime as well. So instead of having a uh, registration database, we basically take advantage of like cloud metadata um, to provide uh, that mapping and we use signatures to ensure authenticity. Um, also, because of the way that we do attestation for containers, which is that the uh, host agent or host node signs the metadata identity document and passes that 
in, or really it signs its kind of equivalent of the workload attestation, the um, assertion that the code running in this container is running on this container ID. It passes that back into the container and then that's passed off to the server. We don't have any separate uh, server workload endpoint. All of our nodes use their node SIV, SVID directly. And that's because uh, containers attest themselves directly to the server just the same way that uh, a first class node does in our ecosystem. So, you know, some minor architectural differences. And I've kind of opened up an issue that would allow us to sort of bridge the gap um, between the way we think about node versus workload and what Spiffy has right now. Um, and I mentioned that because, you know, we're, we're really excited about the Spire project. Um, Spire does a lot of things that Netflix doesn't, and I'm about to enumerate some of the coolest stuff, um, but I think I could have an entire slide about what, Nef uh, what Spire does that Netflix doesn't. Um, so we're really excited about being able to take advantage of a lot of things that Spire does. Um, and so we're, we're really hopeful that we can uh, continue working with the community to kind of bridge the differences between Netflix and Spire in order to uh, then adopt it and take advantage of a lot of the things that Spire does. So just an example of some of the things that Spire has, it's got a really wide variety of node testers and resolvers, you know, it works with a lot of different cloud providers like GCP and Azure, um, you know, we're really kind of focused on AWS. Um, and so it does a lot of things that we don't in that realm. Um, it has this notion of upstream authority. So you can use things like AWS's, uh, you know, private certificate authority instead of uh, just having certs on disk. Um, and you know, it also enables this sort of nested spire and federation model that gives you kind of HA and gives you these segregated uh, spire servers. We basically kind of have, have more of a monolith uh, architecture. Um, spire has really invested in sort of high availability and um, uh, architecture that, that really kind of enables that. Um, and it's also kind of, especially with its uh, implementation of the, the newer JOT standard supports being in an outright OIDC provider and federation with that. And I really love the way that Spire uh, enables um, being an OIDC provider for AWS and therefore allows workloads that say aren't running in the AWS cloud, like in a data center to use their Spiffy ID directly to then go get some AWS credentials. So you get back to this place where you don't need some long lived AWS key to go uh, get AWS credentials. Everything continues to be short lived and part of the same ecosystem. So yeah, Spire does a lot of things that Netflix doesn't at this point. So I'm very excited about the project. So that is all that I have today. Uh, I'm really thankful that folks have uh, come listen to this. Um, and I think Mayor is going to help field some questions. But um, of course, like I said at the top, please feel free to reach out afterwards if there's anything that uh, you want to talk about or, or ask. Yeah, great, Ian. Um, I think this was very insightful for me. I'm sure other community members too. There were a few folks who had to drop off uh, for another meeting. Um, another SIG meeting apparently was at the same time, but I've see, start, they posted their questions before they went away um, because they wanted them to be recorded afterwards. Uh, I know Eli from ByteDance had a question. Uh, basically in your threat model, you have to trust a uh, cloud provider. Have you ever considered it to push it even further and remove cloud provider from your chain of trust? Um, it's something that's at least crossed our minds. At the moment, um, cloud providers kind of, you, you really kind of have to implicitly trust your cloud provider because you're running code on their hardware and their hypervisor can poke in and steal any of your secrets if they really wanted to, if they wanted to be malicious. So if you don't trust your cloud provider, you've got problems. Yeah. That being said, some of the newer technologies that exist um, are kind of uh, providing some sort of remote attestation um, that kind of roots the trust in, in hardware that proves that, um, you know, your cloud provider isn't messing with your workloads. And I think to the extent of that becomes available and sort of easy to consume, it would kind of allow us to uh, move our trust model a bit. Great. Um, I, I think uh, um, one more question that Evan had, I know he had mentioned it to me. Um, in terms of attributes, 
Uh, do you have some examples of what kind of attributes you use and some example of how you use them in authorization policies? Yeah, so the, the example that I went through a little bit where we sort of have the same service name or, or app name, but then kind of have more, more granular identification below that. Um, so like a detail um, or, or different stacks. Um, you know, one example of just how we, how we use those more granular identities. As developers are working on features and new functionality, they often deploy that uh, uh, kind of test build with the same app name, but with a different stack that indicates that it has this feature. And, you know, that's not necessarily used for more granular access control, but it's useful to have that distinct identity for the sake of metrics and insights. And so we can see, like, did this change to how we do IPC, like totally crush upstream services um, with some kind of hot loop or something. So it, it also gives us a lot of insight um, just into our environment from you know, more of an access control point of view. Uh, okay. The AWS account specifically is really useful for us. Um, we've kind of been, been moving to utilizing more and more AWS accounts because of the isolation that different AWS accounts provides us. And we've uh, been, and as part of that, we've had to move services from one account to another as we get uh, more isolated places to put it. So the app name by itself is useful most of the time, but when we start caring about, well, is this coming from an AWS account that we know is more locked down than sort of the general purpose account that developers are using, that can be useful to have a stronger assertion about, for example, this uh, bit of code is running in our PCI compliant environment versus it has the same app name, but was deployed in some other AWS account. Great, I think we have time for two more questions. I have two, three more. Um, how so Michael is asking, how do lambdas in the Netflix ecosystem get their identity? Yeah, so that's uh, a tricky one. Um, the AWS, as far as I know, I don't know if anything has changed since the last time I looked at it, doesn't provide the same sort of attestation tooling as it does for uh, EC2. Um, so what we do instead is uh, pivot a little bit um, and instead rely on the IAM role that's assigned to lambdas as sort of a kind of attestation about what, uh, what function is running there. Um, so we kind of have a tighter control of our control plane in that case and say, well, only this uh, function, only this code can use this IAM role um, and don't allow developers to direct access to the account where these things run. So we're able to get uh, attestation about what IAM role a Lambda has using uh, basically pre-signed URLs um, and end up using that to kind of map back to the uh, name that a function should have. And it's definitely not the same degree of confidence that we have for something like EC2 where we've got that AMI that we can bind it to, um, but it's kind of the best, best things we've found so far. <laughs> Great. Michael, I hope that answered your question. Um, I know Madhu shared a link as well. Uh, we have a question by Emuel. Uh, given that Netflix has been around for a while, did you have to transition from a legacy identity solution to this SFID based one? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so that example I had at the top where we gave developers key stores and we gave them passwords um, and told them, you know, don't share this. And then they did. Uh, that's, that's absolutely a thing that happened. And that was kind of our V1 uh, identity ecosystem. So we had to migrate people from those identities to our universal ones. And there was definitely a migration path. And, you know, the way you handle that is we started doing mutual TLS with the new identities on a new port. So services started accepting those. Um, they kind of had a mapping between the old identities and the new ones. And once services had that enabled, we could get clients to switch to the new ones and just drop those old key stores entirely. Um, so there was definitely a, a campaign. And you know, one of the first things you have to do is find all the people that are on that old identity ecosystem, ask them to kind of support both, get some logging about how many of their clients are still using the old versus the new, and you can kind of go then campaign those uh, clients to move to the, the new ecosystem um, based on those, those metrics you have from the service providers. So it's, 
it's non-trivial, but uh, really valuable. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, another question, if you have one trust domain, are there any issues with global worldwide operations? Global what? Uh, global worldwide operations. Global worldwide operations. So we have a single trust domain in the sense of having a single uh, like root CA that everyone trusts and everything will chain up to. Um, but we do have independently deployed uh, Spire server equivalents or bootstrap server um, deployed uh, in independent regions. So uh, each of those regions is gonna have its own CA that's issued off the root CA, um, but they uh, do operate independently. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah. And another one, um, using certificates is great, but how do you propagate SFID through the infrastructure? For example, assume you have an API gateway to which you need to connect to uh, using HTTPS. Can you, uh, can you pass a user certificate in the request as well? Um, yeah, so that is a really hard problem that we've <laughs> been trying to solve for the last couple of years. And we're finally getting to a place that um, we think is a good solution for that. And that's uh, sort of what I was alluding to a little bit with uh, how, how we are using JOTS in our ecosystem and why we're kind of excited to see the, the JOT SFIDs that Spiffy has. So. Uh, short answer is no. Certificates are not going to allow you to do that sort of transitive on behalf of uh, identity and passing around certificates is not a good solution because certificates should be treated as completely public. Um, you should pretend that there's a, you know, open database of certificates, like a certificate transparency log, for example. Um, so anyone can go pull any certificate they want from that. Um, so those are not, not a good option to pass around as sort of proof of who called you. Um, JOTs are much better suited to that. By design, they are meant to be bearer tokens, meaning that just holding it means that you should be considered to have the authority of the subject uh, in that token. Um, the way that we utilize those specifically, we will only use them over mutual TLS connections. So you have to have certificates first. And then, uh, so a service still connects to another service using mutual TLS, but that JOT token from the original requester can be passed along. Um, and so the access control we end up doing ends up being an intersection of both the uh, direct caller who's doing the mutual TLS connection and the original caller as uh, determined by that JOT token. Great, thank you. I hope, um, Ian, you answered a lot of the questions, but um, I know we are at top of the art. Thank you so much for all the folks that's hung around. Um, I know there was another SIG meeting going on as well. Thank you so much. If you want to know about more about Spiffy Inspire, um, you can go to spiffy.io or join us on Slack. Ian is on Slack too, and usually he's very responsive. So if you have any more questions about his presentation uh, while you were live, or if you're watching this as a recording afterwards, uh, feel free to ping him on Slack, Spiffy Slack. Thank, thank you so much, Ian. All right. Yeah. Thank you all for, for coming and saying.